Hello church family, I'm Jackson and welcome to our online service. Today we are continuing in our series on prayer called Deeply Rooted with a message from Pastor John. But first I wanted to share with you what's coming up at our church. First, we're less than two weeks away from our all church event, RSVP Spacious Life. At this event, we'll spend time learning together how we could love our neighbors better, live out our mission for God, and find our identity outside the business we all experience. This event will be May 13th from 9.30 to 12.30 p.m. Be sure to sign up at ucub.com slash RSVP and talk to Rachel Speedy if you have any questions. Also, we have an opportunity this month to join together in the care for our environment and encourage a healthy lifestyle through riding our bikes. May is Bike Month and we would love for all of our cyclists to join in recording your bike miles during this month. You can register at lovetoride.net and make sure you join the group University Covenant Church. Finally, we invite you to our celebration. Our wonderful youth pastor Sarah Fisher is concluding her ministry here at UCC and beginning a new role at another Covenant Church at the beginning of the summer. Come join us in celebrating her on Sunday, June 4th from 12.15 p.m. to 2.15 p.m. Lunch and cake will be provided. Hope to see you there. Now as we continue our service, will you please join me in prayer? Lord, thank you for letting us be guided through prayer with you. I know it's very important that we pray daily with you and that we can just become one with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning again, church. It's great to see you all. Um, I said good morning, but I didn't hear anything back. Good morning, church. There we go. Hey, uh, I want to let you know, some people have been asking about, you know, with our, what's going on in our city and safety. I have a message from Glenn, our director of operations, just to keep you guys in the loop and some things going on in our church. Um, we are in the process of developing a UCC safety and security team uh, to help ensure that we provide the safest possible environment for our kids and adults attending during our weekly services. Uh, in addition, uh, Rachel Speedy has been fostering a great working relationship with the Davis Police Department. Uh, last Friday, she took a security, security board. I know what it is. I still can't say it. Uh, and fondue to the police department who were working on the case. And on Tuesday, we took 20 burritos there as well. So aren't you jealous you're on Davis PD? Also, we collected and uh, bought, brought uh, appreciation cards for the, from the community to the police department as well. I'm also, you know, we're in this series on prayer, and I just have been so grateful to see some of the prayer movements that have happened as well. Uh, last Tuesday, our prayer team and many others came together, about 30 of us came together to pray for our city uh, and pray for our youth. And then um, I want to give you an update, too, that during this season on the first and third Sundays, right here today, from 1045 to 1115, there's going to be a prayer time in room 109 for our uh, Davis youth, uh, the search for our new youth pastor, uh, and for the, the mental health of our youth as well. And I'll share a little more about that, but just to let you know that's going on as well. So church, way to go putting in prayer into our daily lives. Amen. We're going to continue our series in prayer. We're in a six-week series. This is week number two called Praying for Our Needs. Praying for Our Needs. I, I'm trying to imagine the situations the disciples must have felt, felt when they watched Jesus pray. It seems like they just saw him praying regularly. I don't think he was making a demonstration out of it. I don't think he was making a show of it. He was just praying to his heavenly Father regularly. But something about how he was praying caught the disciples' attention. And it seems like in a random point when he was praying, they interrupt his prayer and say, hey, Jesus, 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 can you teach us how to pray? There's something you're doing here that we want to understand, that we want to learn. We like how you're praying. Will you teach us how to pray? And so Jesus prays and gives them a model of prayer called the Lord's Prayer. He didn't call it the Lord's Prayer. We called it that afterwards. 
He says, this then is how you should pray in Matthew chapter 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But right at this point in the prayer, something switches. Something turns. And Jesus changes the focus of the prayer. Where up until now it was about God and who he is and his kingdom. He intentionally switches it. And he says this. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus spends half the prayer, the second half, praying for his needs and the needs of those around him. He asks for provision, he asks for pardon and forgiveness, and he asks for protection. And how funny is it that so many times we feel like we don't want to bother someone with our requests, and yet Jesus modeled something that God wants to hear in our prayers, prayers for our needs. But isn't that selfish? Shouldn't we always be thinking about other people? Well, of course, that's part of what it means to follow Jesus, but we're able to do that because Jesus takes care of our needs. And how does he take care of our needs? We ask him for our needs. We ask him. And not only is it okay to pray for your needs, Scripture actually encourages it. So the theme I want to talk about today is the whole idea of praying for our needs. Now, what's very, very interesting is that the God of the Bible, the God that revealed himself to Israel, was a stark contrast to the gods that people worshipped back then. And when you understand the contrast, you get a better picture of who our God, the true God, is. The gods that people prayed to before God revealed himself in the Old Testament, they basically prayed as if they were trying to force the God's hands into listening to him. Listening to them, excuse me. If there's this idea like, this, the gods we pray to don't care, and we have to do things, we have to do rituals, we have to do sacrifices, we have to do all these things to get this God's attention. But when God revealed himself, he revealed himself as someone who was incredibly willing to work, willing to listen, eager to listen. Jesus tries to give this idea of, look, look, you might have a picture of God that's not accurate. It's not biblical. It comes from the world. Let me tell you what our God is like. And he tells two parables. One's the parable of a widow who is pleading for justice, and she has to beg the king to get attention. And Jesus says, see that? Your God, our God, is the opposite of that. You don't need to plead. He is eager to listen and eager to bring justice. He tells another parable about a friend who was knocking at a neighbor's door at midnight to provide for another friend, and that neighbor was so resistant to getting woken up. And Jesus says, this is not our God. Our God is eager. He's not like the sleeper, but he's eager to respond. What would happen to your prayer life, praying for your own needs, if you knew and believed that God was eager to do so? Eager to listen. Eager to interact. How many times do you go into prayer thinking, oh, God's probably not interested. I'm going to spend this first tar- part of my prayer life trying to change his mind. Scripture says that's not the God we worship. The God we worship, there's no mind changing needed. He wants to hear your prayers, and he is eager to do so. Maybe that's what the disciples saw in Jesus' posture, that he was so willing to ask for his needs because he knew his father wanted to listen to him. That was one big difference. There was another big difference between the gods of that day and the God that revealed himself to the people of Israel. The gods of that day, when people prayed to those gods, it was all about who those gods are, their qualities and their attributes. Now, this was true of the prayers of the people in the Old Testament about the Hebrew God, that he is wonderful, amazing, omniscient, all-powerful. But they also praised God for the ways he was active in human history, the things he was actually doing or has done, where the prayers of the gods back then, they didn't refer to that at all. It was always about up there, but there was very little about praising the gods for what they were doing. But there was this sense that God revealed himself that not only is he eager, that he's incredibly active in human history. 
He likes to work in our stories. He's not just distant out there, but he's eager to be involved. And we can actually praise God for the things that he has done in human history. And that changed their mindset. What if your prayer life was shaped not only by a belief that God was eager to hear your needs, but he was actually active and he was going to do something about that. And he's not just distant and he's not just putting you off and thinking, don't bother me, but he loves to interact in human history. This is the God we worship. And there was one more big difference that contrasts as to what God revealed about himself versus the gods that were worshipped back then. And the gods that were worshipped back then, it was a one-directional relationship. You just speak and pray to the gods, hoping they'll listen. It's like, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. you know, let's, let's see if this works. But the God of the Hebrews realized that it's not just one way, but it's a two-way interaction. That when we pray to our God, it's actually conversational. It's not just one directional, but two directional. So when God revealed himself, he revealed that, that contrast to the culture was believed, that he was eager, that he was active, and that he was conversational. And I wonder if the disciples looked at Jesus and saw Jesus praying to this kind of God and said, Jesus, teach us to pray like that. Again, what would change about your prayer life when it comes to your own needs and your own burdens, the things you carry on your shoulders, the anxieties you feel? What would change about your prayer life if you understood and believed fully that God was eager to listen to you, that he was active in your history, and he actually liked to talk to you and wanted to be two-way? Would that change things? Yes or no? Shout out. Yeah, good. 75% of you. Good. Way to go. And so we see in Scripture that this is the God that people responded to. We see that people are continually bringing their requests to him. Isaac prayed for his wife, Rebecca, to become pregnant. Moses prayed to God for healing. Hezekiah prayed for direction. Nehemiah prayed for favor with governmental authorities. David prayed for the peace of God's people. Paul, the Apostle Paul, prayed for successfully sharing Jesus' good news with people who had not heard before. And the Gospel writer John, in one of his letters, prayed for good health and well-being. We just see throughout Scripture that people have no shame about praying for their own needs. They realize they're praying to a God who is eager to listen, who wants to work, and might even speak and be conversational in return. So this is why Jesus says in Matthew 7, Ask! And it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. He goes on and says, Which of you, if your son asked you for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? It seems like the problem that Jesus is trying to address is that we don't actually ask enough. We don't seek God enough. We don't knock on God's door enough. Paul, in the letter to Philippians, says, Do not be anxious about anything. Why? Because in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Over and over again, part of the prayer life that God is wanting us to have is to not only feel okay about praying for our needs, but to realize who we're praying to, a God who is eager to work, a God who actually does work, who we can praise afterwards for his works. And a God who not only wants to listen to us, but also wants to speak to us. He wants to have a conversation with us as well. And so scripture says, in and out, ask, seek, knock, ask, seek, knock. The author of the letter of James says, we don't have because we don't ask. So many of us are going through life wondering why we feel so alone, why the burdens are on our shoulders. And God is saying, ask me. Ask me. You don't need to do this alone. So I want to ask you, what burdens are you carrying right now? 
What worries do you have? What fears and anxieties do you have? This is about work. This is about family. This is about school. This is about relationships. This is about money. This is about housing. This is about your future. Talk to God. Amen. Ask. Ask. Don't do it alone. The way I think about it is I, I found this weight in our closet that tells you how much we use it. I, we also have three sizes of these weights. I intentionally got the lightest one, just want to let you know. But I feel like most of us, including me, will walk around carrying a weight. Little worries that happen throughout our day. We get an email that bothers us. Oh. We have an interaction with someone that was, didn't go as well. We look at our bank account or something that was spent on our credit card by another family member that wasn't us. Ugh. <laughs> we look ahead on our budget and think, how is this going to happen? We pay for a great vacation and come back and realize we probably shouldn't have paid for that great vacation. We, some of us have kids who are making decisions who are like, oh, heavy. Some of you guys have parents who are perfect, I mean, not perfect, and feels like, why are they making those decisions? Sometimes work decisions are being made or church decisions are being made, and it just feels like a weight. And what we do is we carry these weights without even realizing it. We feel it on our shoulders. We rehearse them over and over in our heads. And if we are praying to a God who's not eager to help us, well, then I'm going to keep this by myself. If we're praying to a God who doesn't really act and just is distant, well, why even pray? If we're praying to a God who just wants to hear from us but doesn't speak to us, well, that doesn't feel very intimate or close. I'll just hold on to this. But what happens when you pray? God, you're actually eager to hear about this. I didn't know you cared that much. God, can we talk about this? God, you say you want to act on this. Uh, you're not telling me how you're going to act, but you care enough to do something about this. Man, I want to give this to you now. And God, you could say that, you say that when I talk to you about this, you want to give me a message. Maybe you'll speak through your word, or maybe I'll hear you in prayer, or maybe I'll hear from someone else, another believer who speaks your truth to me. God, this is different. Why am I carrying this? And so what happens is you give this weight over to God. Now, when we give it over, it's not always taken care of right away. But we're not caring anymore. Amen? It just feels so much lighter. We've put the weight into the hands of someone who we trust completely. I'm not sure if you've ever had a burden, maybe at work or something, where you're like, oh, who's going to take care of this? It feels so much, it feels so heavy. And then you find someone who can and will take care of it for you. It's just a relief. God says, give me your burdens. Pray to me and ask. There's a hymn that many of us know called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I'm just going to read the lyrics. There's three verses. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who with all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise and forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Amen? Amen. What happens when we pray to the God who is eager, who takes action and is conversational? I'll tell you the first thing. Is there's immediate comfort. Not necessarily because all your problems are solved right away, because, but because you have consciously put your dependence in the hands of a God who knows the best, who is capable, and is willing. 
there's just a sense of it's not my burden to carry alone anymore. There's a relief. There's a comfort. Sometimes when you give your concerns and you pray for your needs and you give that burden over to Jesus, sometimes there's just clarity or crystallization. You know, Jesus, when, right before he was crucified, prayed, My Father, if it, is not po- if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Even in his prayer, Jesus was being honest about what he wanted, but as he prayed, he got a sense of, this is what I'm to do. Often when we give our burdens to Christ, he will speak to us through scripture or through impressions, and we just get a sense of, this is what you want me to do. So we have this clarity, a crystallization of what we're to do. Finally, we get the joy of collaboration with God. He takes action. And prayer in ways that are hard to explain and no one really does comprehend, prayer actually makes a difference in human history. It actually does change outcomes. Prayer makes a difference. And when you pray and you see God come through, you praise God and you go, he let me be part of that. And there's this joy of collaboration. This is why we pray and we pray and we pray. So church, This week, I have a challenge for you. I want you to spend some time identifying your weights. Some of your weights are a lot bigger than this one. I'm just too tired to carry the big one right now. What weights are you carrying? There's an, uh, in our life group, there's an assignment. Some of your life group leaders might do this in your groups, but to take three minutes and make a list of all the weights you're carrying, all the needs in your life that you worry about. And then to spend five minutes just praying through those, asking God specifically for your desires. Will God always say yes? No. A good parent never says yes all the time. But will he listen and do what's best for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you ask God to fulfill those. Church, I pray that this week we make a practice of asking for our needs. Jesus wants you to. The Bible commands you to. It's modeled through all, all throughout Scripture. And what that shows is your belief in the kind of God that wants to listen and does something about your prayers. I shared a little earlier that one way we're doing that is every other week, first and third Sunday starting today, we're going to have a, a small prayer time for youth, for parents, and for the youth pastor search be room 109, and it's just 30 minutes long from 1045 to 1115. If you have some time, stop by and make that part of your routine for the times you can do that. In your life groups, those of you in life groups, I encourage you to make prayer a regular part of what you do. There's no shame in sharing prayer requests and praying for one another and praying for your own needs. It's part of what God asks us to do. My prayer, church, is that the weights we carry, we will hand over to God. Um, Becky, can you stand up just for a sec? Becky's not God. I'm just using this as an illustration. Can you hold this for me? Oh, I feel so much better. That's what God wants for you. Just give it over to him. He'll take care of it. Your job is to ask and to ask for your needs. Amen? Let's pray right now. Thank you, sweetheart. God, thank you for not only a gift of asking you for our needs, but a command. Oh, God, I I love the words of those hymns. It says, what burdens we carry all because we do not take it to you. Jesus, what a friend we have in you. Oh, Lord, I pray you would build in through your spirit a, a habit, a regularity of identifying our weights and giving them over to you and asking for what we need. I pray that you would change the conception in our mind of you that if in any sense we get the sense that you're not willing or that you're distant or that our prayers don't make a difference or that you don't want to interact with us, God, will you just help us throw those images away and get the more accurate picture of who you are? God, thank you for revealing yourself to us as a God who is eager, a God who is one who takes action, and a God who is conversational. Oh, Lord, I pray that picture will change our hearts in prayer and that you would form us into a church that prays regularly praise often for the world, for our church, for our family, and for our own needs as well. We praise in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.